Well, welcome back to Judges. This is our second week looking at the life of Samson and we're going to see how his story progresses after the promising start in chapter 13. We learned last week that Samson has been set apart since before birth to begin the rescue of God's people from the Philistines. But I told you that Samson's story mirrors the life of Israel as a whole. So it shouldn't surprise us that things are going to go downhill very quickly. Samson will be a man of compromise, one who does what is right in his own eyes, rather than one who does what is right in the eyes of the Lord. So turn to chapter 14 and I'll read from verse one. Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timna. Now get her for me as my wife. His father and mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She's the right one for me. So Samson goes down to Timnah, which is a town on the border of Judah where the Philistines live. It seems a good place for Israel's deliverer to start some kind of confrontation with the Philistines. But that's not Samson's priority. He sees a young woman there and he wants her for his wife. He says to his parents, get her for me. His parents are understandably upset. They have brought Samson up to deliver Israel from the Philistines, but instead he wants to intermarry with them. Now we need to understand that verse three is not a verse against interracial marriage. The issue with this woman is not her race, but her religion. Israel are to be set apart as God's chosen people. We saw in the introduction they're not to integrate with the nations around them so they won't be ensnared into worshipping other gods. The book of Judges shows what happens when they ignore this command. They reject the Lord, do evil, worship false gods and suffer oppression. Samson's parents seem to have enough understanding of the law to know this marriage is not right, so they refuse. But Samson is insistent, get her for me. She's the right one for me. Another translation reads, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. Now he doesn't mean she is beautiful to me, but she is the choice of wife that seems right to me. Samson is controlled by his senses rather than God's standards, his instincts rather than God's instructions and the results will be shocking. But verse four gives us a hint that while Samson is doing what he wants without any regard for God, God is also doing what he wants through Samson. Verse four, his parents did not know that this was from the Lord who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines for at that time they were ruling over Israel. It's a confusing verse, but it's key to the story. It is not God's will that Samson should sin, but God, knowing Samson's heart, will use Samson's sin to bring a necessary confrontation with the Philistines. While the Israelites are content to live peaceably among the Philistines, there is no hope of deliverance eventually they'll be completely absorbed into pagan culture. The only thing that will rouse them from their complacency is a confrontation with the Philistines. And God will use Samson's sin to bring that about. It will result in the conflict and division that is needed if God's people are to return to him. God will use Samson's weaknesses to bring about a relationship with this woman that will lead to hostility. So Samson is wrong to pursue this woman, but God will work through him in his sinfulness. What does this teach us about God? 
is shows that he is so committed to his covenant promises that he not only works to fulfill them in spite of his people's sin, but even through their sin. He can use their sinfulness to bring about their deliverance. We see this elsewhere in the Bible, in the lives of people like Joseph and Moses, and most significantly, we see it at the cross. In his Pentecost sermon in Acts 2, Peter tells the Jews that Jesus was handed over to them by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. Wicked men put Jesus to death on the cross, but God was working through their wickedness to bring deliverance for his people. So that's what's going on here in verse four. God will use Samson's weakness and sin to drive a wedge between the Israelites and the Philistines. He will not allow his people to be swallowed up and destroyed by the culture they've embraced. He will work through Samson's sin to rescue them. And sometimes we need God to stir up conflict between us and the world so that we will not grow comfortable here, so that our hearts will not be enticed away from him, so that we will cry out to him. Perhaps you've experienced that in your own life. Have there been times where you've been too comfortable in the world, too attached to it, and God has brought trouble, maybe through your sin or maybe through someone else's, to remind you who you belong to and who will save you? If so, thank him for that. That is grace. So Samson and his parents go down to Timnah to meet this young woman. And on the way, the law provides an opportunity to show Samson he's making him strong. He gives a preview of the supernatural strength he will give him to defeat the Philistines. A lion comes roaring towards him. Verse six tells us, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. But he told neither his father nor his mother what he has done. Uh, Samson doesn't acknowledge the Lord. Uh, God has given him this extraordinary strength, but he is focused on pursuing this girl that he wants. He is still pursuing what is right in his own eyes, not the Lord's. Later, when he returns to marry her, he sees the carcass of the lion he killed. But instead of avoiding the dead body because of his Nazarite vow, he goes over to look at it and finds a swarm of bees and some honey inside. He scoops the honey out with his bare hands and eats it. And then he gives some to his parents without telling them where it's from and they eat it too. And so his parents who have faithfully kept him clean throughout his life are made unclean by his actions. When they get to Timna, Samson holds a seven day bachelor party for the young men of the town who are chosen to be his companions. Again, we see Samson fully immersed into the pagan culture, partying with the people he has been set apart to defeat. But what also comes out here is Samson's pride and greed. He tells his companions a riddle and makes a bet with them. If they can solve the riddle by the end of the seven days, he will give each of them a set of clothing and underwear. If they can't solve the riddle in that time, they must each provide him with a set. It's a costly bet, but Samson is fairly sure he will come out of it a wealthy man. He fixes the result by telling a riddle he knows they won't be able to solve. But when they can't work out the answer, they come up with a plan. Let's go to verse 15. On the fourth day, they say to Samson's wife, coax your husband into explaining the riddle for us, or we will burn you and your father's household to death. Did you invite us here to steal our property? It is a shocking plan. Samson's bride is put in a terrible position. She can either be loyal to Samson, who she's not officially married yet, or be burnt alive along with her family. Verse 16 and 17. Then Samson's wife threw herself on him sobbing. You hate me. You don't really love me. You've given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. 
I haven't even explained it to my father or mother, he replied. So why should I explain it to you? She cried the whole seven days of the feast. So on the seventh day, he finally told her because she continued to press him. She in turn explained the riddle to her people. Now, I don't think this woman is being manipulative. She reacts in a completely normal way. We don't even know if she wants to marry Samson. It's likely she's had no say in that decision. And she certainly doesn't know him well enough to choose loyalty to him over the lives of her family. So when Samson tells her the answer, of course she passes it on. She's acting to save life. When the Philistines come back to Samson with the right answer, he's angry with them for cheating. And so he takes revenge. Verse 19. Then the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He went down to Ashkelon, struck down 30 of their men, stripped them of everything and gave their clothes to those who had explained the riddle. Burning with anger, he returned to his father's home. It's an extreme reaction. Rather than pay his gambling debt out of his own pocket, he attacks 30 men from another town and takes their clothes from them. Then he returns home, leaving his bride behind. Finally, Samson is willing to attack the Philistines, but it is not out of a desire to save Israel. His motive is revenge, as well as being able to pay his debts without losing out himself. He is motivated by pride, greed and anger. But what is God doing? Verse 19 says, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. Why does God enable him to act in such a violent and vengeful way? Well, again, he is working through Samson's sin to cause hostility between Israel and the Philistines. This is how he will extract Israel from the Philistines and away from the pagan culture they've grown to love. And so despite Samson's sinful choices, the spirit comes to work through him to begin this separation that is desperately needed. Samson returns home and his bride is given to one of his best men. Her father understandably assumes Samson is not coming back for her after what's happened and he needs to save face and provide a husband for her. But after he has calmed down, Samson decides he wants her after all. He returns to Timna to sleep with her, but her father won't let him in. He tells Samson she is now married to another man and he offers her younger sister instead. Samson is furious and again he seeks revenge. So chapter 15, verse 3. Samson said, this time I have a right to get even with the Philistines. I will really harm them. So he went out and caught 300 foxes and tied them tail to tail in pairs. He then fastened a torch to every pair of tails lit the torches and let the foxes loose in the standing corn of the Philistines. He burned up the shocks and standing corn together with the vineyards and olive groves. So we're told in verse one of chapter 15 that this is the time of the wheat harvest. And so the grain is dry and ready to be ignited. This fire will ensure that the three main crops of the land are wiped out for that year. It is a devastating loss for the Philistines, but it's not Samson they punish. Verse 6, when the Philistines asked who did this, they were told Samson the Timnite's son because his wife was given to his companion. So the Philistines went up and burned her and her father to death. What Samson's bride feared most actually happens. She and her father are burned to death. It's a shocking overreaction and it shows just how evil the Philistines are. This is why God's people must be divided from them. Well, Samson attacks the Philistines and slaughters many of them. But again, he's not doing this out of a desire to fulfil his calling as the deliverer of God's people. He is still motivated by personal anger, by pride and revenge. 
But while Samson continues to act out of sinful motives, God is working through his sin to increase the tension between his people and the Philistines. When Samson goes down to Etam, which is in Judah's territory, the Philistines follow him. In verse 10, they say to the people of Judah, we've come to take Samson prisoner to do to him as he did to us. And so verse 11, then 3,000 men from Judah went down to the cave in the rock of Etam and said to Samson, don't you realise that the Philistines are rulers over us? What have you done to us? He answered, I merely did to them what they did to me. They said to him, we have come to tie you up and hand you over to the Philistines. Samson said, swear to me that you won't kill me yourselves. Agreed, they answered, we will only tie you up and hand you over to them. We will not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and led him up from the rock. So 3,000 men from Judah go to capture Samson and hand him over to the Philistines. The fact that so many of them go suggests they've heard about his supernatural strength. But instead of wondering if his strength could be their way out of oppression, if he could be the next deliverer sent by God to save them, they're willing to hand him over. They would rather live at peace with the Philistines than risk confrontation with them. They would rather continue to worship the false gods of the nations than be free to serve the one true God. And we could be quick to judge them until we remember that we are often just the same in our attitude towards the world. Samson is no better. He knows he's supposed to be the next deliverer. And God has shown he will empower him with extraordinary strength when it is needed. But he's not interested in delivering Israel. He is set only on personal revenge. And he assumes God will give him the strength he needs when he wants it. Perhaps it's surprising to us that God does. God does give him the strength to break out of the ropes and kill 1,000 men. But Samson again breaks his Nazarite vow to do so. He uses a fresh jawbone of a donkey, something that is unclean. He presumes on God's empowering, regardless of his own lack of purity. And he gives the credit to himself. Verse 16, then Samson said, with a donkey's jawbone, I have made donkeys of them. With a donkey's jawbone, I have killed a thousand men. Contrast his celebration with Deborah's song in chapter five. There's no mention here of God strengthening him. The victory is his alone. In fact, the first time we read of Samson acknowledging God is in verse 18 when he is tired and thirsty. Finally, he acknowledges God has given him the victory, but it's not a humble acknowledgement. He says, must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? He echoes Israel grumbling in the desert. Have you rescued us from Egypt just so we can die here? But God is gracious. He provides water to revive Samson. Now, if you're like me, you probably think this is unfair. By now, we want God to give up on the idea of using Samson and leave him to self-destruct. But that shows we don't truly understand grace. It shows we secretly believe God should show kindness to people who do the right thing and withhold it from those who don't. What we forget is that we need grace as much as Samson. Left to ourselves, we are just like him, proud, selfish, ambitious for our own glory, drawn to false gods. But God is committed to his covenant promises. He cannot go back on his word. He will remain accessible and available to all who call out to him. He is ready and willing to renew and refresh his people when they ask. Samson is a flawed deliverer. At the end of chapter 15, we read that Samson led Israel for 20 years, but there is no peace. Israel is still under Philistine rule. Next week, we'll see how God will continue working through Samson's weaknesses and sin 
to begin to defeat the Philistines. But for now, let me leave you with two encouragements. First, God is always working out his purposes and even our sin cannot get in the way of that. Rather than be hindered by our sinful choices, he is able to work through them to accomplish what he has planned. So even if you have sinned in spectacular ways, you can be confident that God's faithfulness to you means that he will work through your sin, through your mistakes to complete his mission. And second, God is unrelentingly gracious. Anyone but our God would have rejected Samson as deliverer after he broke his vow. Anyone else would have stopped showing up for him. But God is not like us. He does not choose on the basis of human goodness, but on the basis of grace. He does not reserve kindness for those who deserve it most. He shows grace to the undeserving. And we should be thankful for that because we are undeserving, but he has shown extravagant grace to us in sending a perfect deliverer, Jesus. So let's praise him for that this week.